So, welcome to tonight's Bible study. Tonight, we are going to go over uh, the Bible study is going to be called A Clean Heart. Tonight, we are going to be looking at a clean heart as it relates to Psalms chapter 51, verse 10. And just so you are aware, I did bring a copy of the study. Um, if after the service you want to get a picture of it or, or get the scriptures, you certainly can. Um, it's the longer version, but, um, but I'm going to go ahead and, and give the study now. So what we're going to look at tonight is what a clean heart is, what is the process of getting a clean heart, how you keep it clean, and what is the impact on others when you do have a clean heart. But before we get into Psalms 51 verse 10, we do need to get a background on this scripture. So Psalm, 50, uh, Psalm 51 was a psalm that was written by King David when he was confronted by his own sin. What was the sin? What happened? Well, we need to reference 2 Samuel chapter 11 and chapter 12, but I'm not going to read all these scriptures tonight. Instead, I'm just going to do a quick, a quick, brief outline view of them. So to get a greater background, you can read over these two chapters sometime later. So now let us get a, let's, let's review 2 Samuel chapter 11. So in 2 Samuel chapter 11, it is a time when kings are supposed to go to war. Israel is at war with Ammon. The armies are in battle, and usually the king goes to battle with them, but in this case, King David decides to, decides to stay home. Because of this, King David ends up committing adultery with Uriah the Hittite's wife. King David tries deceit and trickery to cover his sin by pulling Uriah out of the war, thinking that if Uriah gets with his wife, then that'll provide a cover for the sin. Unfortunately, this ploy does not work. So what does King David do? He sets Uriah up and he ends up having him killed in battle. Though King David is not the one that actually is shooting the arrows, uh, it is King David that orchestrates the murder. Moving on to 2 Samuel chapter 12, we discover, we find out that Nathan the prophet confronts King David. He tells him about a poor man that had only one ewe lamb. Nathan tells David that it was the man's only lamb and that he raised it and nourished it like it was his own daughter and loved it like it was his own, it was his own daughter. Then he told him that a rich man who had a whole flock of sheep spared of his own flock and went and took the poor man's one, one, one lamb and had it killed so that he could dress it and serve it to his friends. This news enraged King David who pronounced that the rich man who did this shall surely die and he shall restore to the man fourfold because he had no pity on him, on the poor man. So when King David makes this proclamation, Nathan reveals that he is the rich man who took the poor man's only lamb. King David had multiple wives, Uriah only had one. David took her for himself, and then he had Uriah killed. God pronounces judgment against King David. When King David hears this, he immediately admits his sin. Now, let us go to verses 13 and 14 of 2 Kings chapter 12. So in 2 Kings chapter 12, verses 13 and 14, it says, And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. Howbeit, because by this deed thou hast given a great occasion to thine enemies, to the enemies of the Lord, to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. So the reason I told you all of this was to get things set up for our, our main scripture, which comes from Psalm 51. This is the psalm that was written because of what we just read. Knowing what happened helps us to get a good understanding of this psalm and to, and to put it into context. So now let us go to Psalm 51, verses 1 through 11. So in Psalm 51, verses 1 through 11, we read, 
Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out thy, my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgression, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. So here's what we know. King David committed a grievous sin. In Psalm 51, verses 1 through 4, he acknowledges and confesses his sin. He confesses that he, what he had done is very evil. In verses 5, he acknowledges the depth of his sin by stating that his iniquity goes back to the time of his birth. In verse 6, he notes that God desires truth and that God will make him to know wisdom. In verse 7 through 11, he makes his request known unto God. So again, looking at Psalm 51, verse 10, it says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. So Psalm 51, verse 10 is the verse that we are keying off of today. So we must ask ourselves, well, what is a clean heart? Well, the answer is simple. A clean heart is a heart that is free from pollution and filth. When we are saved, we are given a new heart. Now, let us take a look at what the definition of clean is. In Strong's Concordance, Strong's Concordance defines clean to mean, as used in Psalm 51, verse 10, from H2891, pure in physical, chemical, ceremonial, ceremonial or moral sense. Clean, fair, pure. In Webster's 1828 Dictionary, definition number four of that word defines it as free from moral impurity, innocent. So now let us take a look at the definition of heart. In strong concordance, the definition of, definition of heart as used in Psalm 51 verse 10 is a form of H3824, the heart, also used figuratively, very widely for the feelings, the will, and even the intellect. Likewise, for the center of anything, care for, comfortably, consent, considered, courageous, friendly, broken, hard, merry, stiff, stout, double-hearted, heed, I, kindly, midst, minded, regarded, themselves, unawares, understanding, well, willingly, wisdom. So, when we are saved and we give our lives to Christ, God gives us a new heart. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 19, we read this. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us unto himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the, word, the, the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. We are the workmanship of God. God puts in us a new, clean heart. After that, it is up to us to make sure that we keep it clean. So, how do we do that? How do we keep our hearts clean? So, well, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, it says we are the workmanship of Christ, or for we are his workmanship, created in Christ unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in him. So, what is the process of getting a clean heart? 
Well, the first thing we have to do is we have to confess and believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. So in Romans chapter 10, verses 8 through 11, we read, But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth, and in thy heart, that is, the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever should believeth on him should not be or shall not be ashamed. Then the next thing is baptism. Romans chapter 6 verses 1 through 4 says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. As we read above in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, when we enter into Christ, all things are new. Our conversation is new, our actions are new, our outlook on life is new, and our heart is new and clean. As we read in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, we should not continue in sin. In Ephesians chapter 4, we learn about putting away the old ways of life. We should henceforth not walk as the Gentiles or people who are living in the world. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 24, we read, This I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanliness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ, if, you, if so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So we put on the new man and we are given a new heart. But what, what about keeping our heart clean? What, what, what must we do when we mess up, when we make a, a mistake? When we find out that we are slipping, we must be willing to acknowledge to God that we have sinned. We must be willing to fess up to him and admit to him that we're wrong. In Psalms chapter 32, verses 1 through 6, it says, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day. For the day and the night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. Selah. I acknowledged my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. Selah. For this shall every one that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him. When we see in this psalm, in verse 3 and 4, King David says, when he kept silence, God's hand was heavy upon him. He said he became dry. But when he acknowledged his sin, when he acknowledged his sin, God forgave him. God speaking through the prophet Jeremiah also says the same thing. In this scripture, we hear God plead with the children of Israel, saying, asking them to only acknowledge their iniquity. He tells them that if they acknowledge their sin, he will take them back. In Jeremiah, Chapter 3, verses 12 through 14, we read, Go 
and, and proclaim these words toward the north and say, Return thou backsliding Israel, saith the Lord, and I will not cause my anger to fall upon you. For I am merciful, saith the Lord, and I will not keep anger forever. Only acknowledge thine iniquity that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God and hast shattered thy ways to the strangers under every green tree, and ye have not obeyed my voice, saith the Lord. Turn, O backsliding Israel, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you, and I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion. James tells us that we must resist the devil and the devil will, and the devil will free, flee from us. So if we resist the devil, he flees. We have, to have a, we have to lead a clean life. We have to have a clean heart. We can draw near to God and he will draw near to us. To do, we'll, he will draw near to us. To do this, we must purify our hearts by humbling ourselves before him. So in James chapter 4, verses 7 and 10, we read, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw an eye to God and he will draw an eye to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. James says, let your laughter be turned unto mourning. In other words, if we are living in sin, if we are, are, are laughing and, and we are having a good time and partying and ignoring the Lord, what he's saying is, let that laughter, let that partying be turned into mourning, and then let our sinful ways be turned into repentance. That's what James is saying. And in the book of Proverbs, we're given a little more detail. We are told that out of the heart are the issues of life. We are to told to remove our feet from evil. Well, how do we do that? Well, let us take a look at Proverbs chapter 4, verses 20 through 27. In Proverbs chapter 4, verses 20 through 27, it says, My son, attend to my words, incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart, for they are life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Put away from thee the froward mouth and perverse lips put far from thee. Let thine eyes look right on and let thine eyelids look straight before thee. Ponder the path of thy feet, and let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand nor to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. So we learn that we must watch what we say. We have to put away perverse lips. We have to keep our eyes straight on the things of God. We have to stay on the right path, not going to the right or to the left. We need to be aware of what, who we keep company with. We may know people who like to live a life of banqueting. They like to live a life of parting. They like to, to hit the bars and live in the world and, and do all manner of reveling. But we need to avoid that life if we want to keep a clean heart. Proverbs chapter 23, verses 19 through 23 says, Hear thou, my son, and be wise, and guide thine heart in the way. Be not among wine big wine bibbers among riotous eat eaters of flesh for the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty and drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags hearken unto thy father that begot thee and despise not thy mother when she is old buy the truth and sell it not also wisdom and instruction and understanding the above scripture tells us to buy the truth and to sell it not we don't want to trade in our hope of salvation for drunkenness and gluttony, which, could, which will send us into a life of spiritual and even financial poverty. How many people do we see out on the streets because of a series or maybe even just one bad decision? We have bought the truth. We bought the truth when we were saved. Let's not sell it, but let us guard it closely. So how do we do that? 
Let us look at Colossians chapter 3. Let us look at verses 1 through 4, where we are told we need to seek those things which are above and set our, and set our affections on them instead of what is here in this life. So in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, it says, If, then, if ye then be risen in Christ, with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also with, appear with him in glory. In, adi in addition to seeking those things which are above, we have to mortify or take strict control over the carnal influences in our lives. If we want to keep a, if we want to keep a clean heart, we have to do that. Colossians chapter 3 verses 5 through 7 lists some of the things that we need to mortify. In Colossians chapter 3 verses 5 through 7 we read, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, covetousness which is idolatry. For which things, this, which, for which things sake, the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. So what does mortify mean? Well, Strong's Concordance defines mortify this way. It says from G3498 to deaden, for example, figuratively, to subdue, to be dead, to mortify. As we read in Colossians, we must set our affections on those things that, which are above. And we have to kill off those things that are contrary to godliness. We have to put away those things of the world, which in this case is the adorning, the lights, the decoration, the sin, all the things that distract us from God. That's of the world, and we need to put that away and, so that it doesn't distract us from a godly life. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, it says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever." So, now that we know that, we, we, we've got to keep a clean heart. We also want to ask, well, what is the impact of having a clean heart on others? Well, for now, we can go to this month's theme scripture. The, the theme scripture for October is Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30, which says, The fruit of righteousness is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. But how can we win souls if our heart is not pure and clean? If it is pure and clean, then we can win souls. Thus, we have an impact on others. So now let us go back to Psalm 51 and take another look at it. This time, let's look at verses 12 through 19. But first, let's look at verses 12 and 13, in which King David requests that the joy of his salvation would be restored so that he would be able to teach transgressors, transgressors and see sinners converted unto God. In Psalm chapter 51, verses 12 through 13, King David says, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. When we have a pure heart, when we have joy, then we can convince those around us who are seeking that there is a better way in Christ. David goes on and requests to be delivered from blood guiltiness. In verses 14, through 14 and 15 of Psalm 51, King David says this. In Psalm 51, verses 14 through 15, it says, Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. When we are delivered from our sins and our hearts are pure, then we can testify of God's righteousness. 
When we show forth God's praise and when we speak of the goodness of Jesus Christ, it has an impact on our brothers and sisters and it has an impact on those that don't know Christ. In Psalm 51, verses 16 through 19, we read this. It says in Psalms 51, verses 16 through 19, For thou desirest not sacrifice, else I would give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. If this sounds familiar to you, then it's probably because you read this in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22, which says, Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. God wants us to have a spirit that is obedient to him. He wants our wild and contrary hearts changed into contrite and obedient hearts. In Psalm 51, verses 18 through 19, it says, Do good in thy pleasure unto Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then shall they offer bullocks upon thine, off, uh, upon thine altar. In verse 18, it says, Do thy good pleasure unto Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. When we have a pure heart, then God can use us to build his kingdom. When our hearts are pure, our impact on others is that we have a testimony and God's light shines through us. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 and 16, we read, Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its, lost its savior, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. A pure heart will always be a positive thing, but not everybody is always going to react to it positively. We must remember that when we walk as blood-washed Christians, we are walking contrary to the world and, their, and its ways. The impact on some is that they are going to hate us. In John chapter 15, verses 18 through 22, it says, Jesus speaking, If the world hates you, you know it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are, ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But all things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin, but now they have no cloak for their sin. So, in conclusion, we are given a new heart when we give ourselves over to Christ and are saved from the pollutions of the world. We can keep a pure heart by saying, staying unspotted from the world, and, and when we fall short, we can go to God for salvation. And when our heart is clean, it will have a positive impact on others. Now, whether or not they receive it positively or not, it is up to them, but, but we will have an impact one way or the other. So to wrap up tonight's study, let's end it with 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 12. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 12 said, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul, 
having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. 